you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I've got some quite good introductions there from the ADS, so I don't need to bore you about who we are and what we do for the next uh, few minutes. So I really want to talk about um, reuse specifically when it comes to digital archives and how that, affected, how that is affected by atypical archives. Okay, so Thomas has already introduced the fair data principles over the last 10 years or so. Archaeologists have been driving more towards making our digital archives more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the people at the ADS have been doing a lot towards that in terms of accessing all of your digital archives. I am contractually obligated to say that we were founded two years before Google, so just so you know. Um, and that we have amassed a huge amount of data now, and we've done quite a lot in order to make all of those archives findable, uh, accessible, and interoperable. And in part, that's because of our open access policy. Uh, all of our archives are available for everybody to download and to reuse. The only problem that we have is despite the infrastructure that we've put into it and the amount of effort and time, we're not really seeing much in terms of reuse. We have built it, but nobody has come to a certain extent. So research is showing that um, archaeology more generally is becoming good at depositing and sharing their data, but not so much uh, reusing it. And uh, that includes uh, uh, research by Jeremy Huggett at the ADS specifically. We're not just seeing the mass amounts of reuse of data that we would like to see. Uh, part of this in terms of is, is not necessarily restricted to digital archives. There was some research done a few years ago, uh, and I would appreciate if anybody has any updated uh, um, references to this, that uh, archives more generally are not being as reused as much as we'd like them to be. Um, but in terms of digital archives, there were very much key questions to what are we using these or reusing this digital archive for? And the experience that we've had is generally uh, research, academic research, or training purposes. So we've got a very narrow, limited, in terms of the wider archaeological profession, about what uh, we're using this data for. And what we are finding ourselves is we're finding it very hard to track reuse. So we use digital object identifiers, DOIs, to uh, accession our archives so that people can use that in terms of their own uh, publications and reference our archives. Uh, that is uh, questionably picked up by some and others, so it makes it harder for us to track. Um, also, it's, we're not really tracking the alternative metrics. It's all just through publications. It's all just through academic-based publications, not the extra things like Wikipedia, like blogs. All of those things could be or, and are using reuse in archives as well. We're just not picking up the data quite as, uh, as handily as we would have liked. So I wanted to stop and talk about why we should even reuse data uh, uh, generally. I think uh, hopefully a lot of people in this room would, uh, uh, would agree that we should be reusing archaeological data because we are a destructive process. And in terms of the theme of the conference, in terms of sustainability, in order to be a sustainable profession, we should be trying to reuse our data as much as possible. Uh, in part, that's because we are increasingly being forced to. Uh, it's becoming a professional standard. It's becoming a requirement in terms of uh, funding, for example. Um, that's also in part because uh, data collection is, is quite hard to do. It's, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. Uh, in terms of the profession more widely, I know that there's an element where you know, we have to collect this data, and obviously that's necessarily necessary. But in terms of other aspects, there is an element where we should um, perhaps um, think about uh, reusing rather than recollecting. Uh, we should also think about reproducibility, uh, think about how we are taking our data and how it could be reused by others in the future. Improving your own skills, um, you know, making your data reusable is a skill set in itself, and by ensuring that your data is more reusable in the future, you are improving your own digital literacy and skill set. So that's an important one. And I've included this quote from Julian Richards, our, uh, our director at the bottom. In terms of making sure the integrity of your data, reuse and thinking about reuse in the long term is the best way to ensure that your data is as, uh, uh, as, as um, is, is, and has as much integrity uh, as possible and can track some of the errors because you're going to be rechecking, reanalyzing your data over and over again. But there are 
Obviously, multiple barriers to reuse, and this is part of the reason why we're not seeing as much reuse as we'd like. Uh, people trusting other people's data sets, other people's archives. Do we have the information? Are we storing the information about how people collect the data so that we can in encourage trust? Whether or not there are social factors, whether or not people uh, uh, like secondary data collection versus primary data collection. We see this a lot in academic research, for example. Um, that actually, data wrangling in order to make a, a data set reusable in a different format might take more effort than actually collecting the data in the first place, which uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it does uh, create a barrier for people to, to cross. Um, having the digital skills, as Thomas mentioned earlier, and, and others that, you know, having the skills in order to make this data uh, even findable, accessible, and interoperable is uh, quite a, a steep learning curve, but reusable becomes a, another, uh, another aspect. And then finally, ineffectual communication. This is essentially the what and the why. Uh, what, what archives do we hold? And how can we tell people about those archives so they can actually reuse them? We have vast quantities of uh, information on the ADS. And just getting that message out to people, here's the data for you to use, is, is quite a tricky one. And finally, why, why bother reusing that data set or data in more generally? So that was a roundabout way to get to atypical archives. So I'll get on with the, uh, the focus of this session. What about atypical archives? Well, as was covered from the previous two talks, which is great, um, what's typical? What's typical in the ADS? And this is what's typical. It's a, a common digital archive from an evaluation, from an excavation. This accounts for the vast majority of the, of the archives that we get in through our ADS Easy system. It's essentially trench photos and reports, WSIs, reports through OASIS. You might get some GIS shape files, trenches, site locations, all of that kind of good stuff that uh, Tegan was talking about in her last presentation. Lots of good information there. We're still not seeing a huge amount of uh, reuse of these archives. But what about atypical archives? Well, these are some of the formats that Tegan mentioned in the previous one, and that's specialist data formats like geophysical data, 3D models, uh, as we saw earlier, audio uh, from oral history collections. They might be spatial data, and I mean more beyond the kind of uh, GIS shapefiles of a trench, but more the spatial data for regions and areas, and the Lee Valley Mapping Project is an example of this to track the archaeological evidence from that area. As Tegan also mentioned from about HS2, large infrastructure projects, this is mass quantities of data, uh, which becomes a, a whole nother thing to, uh, uh, to access and to, uh, um, uh, to, to look at and to, um, to reuse. And then finally, bespoke databases. These are the ones uh, which were mentioned earlier, the, the kind of boring Samian databases, the ones that are for very specific reasons. They're covering very specific areas or very specific uh, uh, time periods. But we should also mention that these, these formats, which might be atypical in the past, are becoming more typical. We're seeing more deposits of these, as Tegan showed in her presentation. So we should really consider that what's atypical yesterday might become typical tomorrow, and we should account for that in the way that we go about uh, our archiving. So how do they exacerbate the lack of data reuse. We, it's all of the things that you would, thank you, it's all of the things that you would expect. Atypical data formats are more difficult to archive. They need specialist skills to reuse. They need specialist skills to, to access that data and rebuild it. And there are fewer people perhaps with that specialist skills who are going to access it. Uh, with extensive data sets, how are you gonna draw through all that information and get to, down to the information and the data that you want? And with atypical databases, they are for very specific use cases. And therefore, in order to reuse them for a different purpose, we have to think about data wrangling. We need to think about editing our data in such a format. And so I think there are also uh, things that are positive for this. And I did notice this this morning, that although I cleverly put encourage at the top, I didn't take out the lack of data reuse. What I mean here is, how do we encourage data reuse through these atypical archives? And what they do is they force us to innovate a little bit better. And the, the, uh, the people at the ADS who work so tirelessly uh, have come out with some of these aspects. You know, if you're thinking about a 3D model and you don't know how to construct a 3D model, how do you even know what you're looking at? Well, we have now, as you've seen earlier, creative displays on the ADS where you can see the 3D model. You can see if you might even want to use it before you then have to go out and get the specialist skills to reuse it yourself. So that's an important step. 
When it comes to large databases, it's bespoke queries. We have query options for these. Uh, uh, the HS2 archive is an example that's coming forward. We'll be able to be able to search that massive database in a much easier way, which is bespoke to that particular database. And it also encourages you to build your own skills for replicable data, uh, uh, for building your own digital literacy, which will help in the future. So there are things that we can take away from this which are uh, very positive. And there are definitely things that we can learn from open science, from data scientists, for example. They think a lot about uh, replicable uh, research. Uh, I've managed to say repl replicable many times without chipping over it, but then I just did there, so we'll, we'll gloss over that. But there is this paper here at the top by uh, archaeologists who now work for the Turing Institute. Uh, and if you're thinking about how to make your data better, this is very much for an academic audience. I would recommend reading this paper because it's very practicable in terms of the steps that you might need to go about it. So how can we encourage the reuse of atypical archives? Lots of different things here that we can do. Part of that is technical considerations that the ADS are continuing to work on. It's not a, a static process. It's something that we need to continue in the future. Um, part of it, it might be planning for reuse. When you're creating your digital archive, what could you be reusing for in the future? How could other people reuse it? What is the impact of your data in the future? And thinking about that from the outset. Um, we need to think maybe a little bit more beyond what our traditional aspect of reuse really is. You know, a lot of the times we're using, reusing data in archaeology, it's to reinterpret a site or it's to quantify a certain type of archaeology, like aggregate projects, for example, uh, like the Roman uh, Settlement of Rural Britain project, for example. So we need to maybe be a little bit more creative. And there are different projects out there, like the Tetrarchs project or the Avery Papers project, which are taking traditional archives, digitizing them, and trying to look at different ways that we can reuse them in the future. And also, we need to think about our digital literacy as archaeologists. There are a vast swathe of training materials out there that we can use uh, and which could be adapted to suit archaeologists archaeologists more specifically. And because of that, we can use those technical skills to reuse and repurpose our own data. So we should think of it, final slide, as part of a reuse cycle. Reuse then feeds into our new projects, into our, uh, our structure of our, our, our projects. We should be thinking of it as a, a whole entity rather than just the end of a spectrum. It should be pushing forward for our new research. Thank you very much. Well, and if anybody's interested, the uh, presentation uh, is, is online as well. I can share the link later.